Well, hello and welcome. My name is Julian Gibb, and I'm currently serving at the Harvest Foundation based here in Phoenix. And today I'm blessed to have with me Scott Allen from DNA. So Scott, welcome, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Julian, thanks. Well, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I uh, was born and raised in Oregon and uh, come from a terrific family. Um, became a Christian when I was uh, a junior in high school through Young Life Ministry up in Canada. So I, uh, I was born again in Canada. I claim Canadian citizenship for that reason as well. So uh, um, during uh, university days uh, in Oregon, I was... Uh, uh, exposed to uh, the power of ideas and worldview. I studied history and philosophy and really loved that and uh, also exposed to quite a bit of Marxist thinking at that time in the 80s um, and uh, felt a strong calling uh, my senior year to, to work with the poor and to serve in Christian missions, join Food for the Hungry, a Christian mission organization based here in Phoenix and served overseas for some time and and then uh, came back and worked for another 25 years or so in staff training and development. And, um, and then in uh, 1997, I joined with Bob Moffitt, uh, the president of Harvest, and Daryl Miller at Food for the Hungry. And we founded the Disciple Nations Alliance, <clears throat> which is really a ministry uh, that uh, kind of continues our heart for the poor. But uh, uh, the, the desire is really to see uh, impoverished communities uh, begin to flourish uh, through the application of biblical truth and, uh, and biblical love. So it was kind of a different approach to, to helping the poor. It wasn't money or projects, it was biblical truth. So uh, we've been doing that uh, ever since and uh, God's really uh, been good and has blessed the ministry. And so it's been, it's been a wonderful journey. Well, wonderful. Oh, maybe I'll just mention too, I'm married and have uh, five fantastic kids and uh, a wonderful wife. So. Yeah. Oh, well, yes, that, that's indeed your crowning glory. So uh, <laughs> what sort of age groups are they? Uh, my uh, oldest, Kayla, is uh, she's 26 and she's a graduate of Biola. She teaches uh, public school now. And then uh, my youngest, Annalise, is uh, she's in sixth grade. She's uh, 12 years old. So. Oh, well, <laughs> so uh, so to put this down to a level that even I can understand, uh dna how does dna serve as jesus's hands and feet you you speak of uh teaching truth and of uh loving uh, compassion and loving your neighbor so how does this actually happen <clears throat> well i i think it's not too complicated frankly i think uh, sometimes we make things overly complicated in this area but uh um our conviction is that um, biblical truth and biblical love, which I define as, you know, doing at, even at great cost to yourself, doing what is best for other people, um, putting their needs ahead of your own, um, seeking their welfare. Uh, so doing these things um, are really the key ingredient. If you want to see people prosper and flourish, uh, that could be your own children, it could be uh, your neighbors, um, it could be an entire nation. Uh, so much of the brokenness in our world is grounded in uh, lies. You know, we have an enemy, uh, Satan, and he, um, he, he exists to destroy and to work against everything that God is for, the, the truth and the goodness and the beauty and the light of his kingdom. And he does that largely through lies and deceptions. So consequently, the best thing we can do as Christians is, uh, is to be able to share biblical truth and do it in a way that's, that's demonstrated in love. So, and we've seen that, uh, you know, example after example of just the power of that, um, that transformation that comes uh, through, through what used to be just basic Christian missions. I mean, there was, this used to be just, you know, the kind of one-on-one of Christian missions. And I, I think in some ways we've gotten away from that, so. Mm. And so, you know, we, we are living in an age of relativity. Um, mm. You know, what, uh, what, what you think is best for you is, is your choice. And what I think is best for me is my choice. Um, mm. 
So you know, do, do we really need this this truth? I mean, you know, can't can't I just get on with my life doing what's best for me, and you just get on doing what's best for you? I mean, what what what's the need for for Jesus and his biblical truth? Can't can't we all just be happy living our own um, our own our own ways? Well, you know, I think, it, you know, it's a good question. It starts from your basic presuppositions about the nature of reality. And, um, you know, as a Christian, um, you know, we, we begin with Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. So before everything, you know, there, there is this God who created everything, including us. And uh, if that's the case, then we only flourish when we understand who he is and who we are in light uh, of that basic reality. Um, and uh, so you can obviously, God, one of the things that we learn in the Bible is God, because he's a loving God, he gives us the freedom to choose. He doesn't make us robots. We don't, uh, you know, we're not puppets on a string. He gives us this capacity because we're made in his image to make choices. And those choices can be to, uh, to reject him. And of course, people have done that. And uh, God gives them the freedom to do that. It's not a happy thing because when they do that, um, they end up hurting themselves. I, I remember uh, this famous quote from uh, Cecil B. DeMille, who was the, uh, the director of the movie, old movie, uh, The Ten Commandments, famous old Hollywood movie. And he, he made a powerful statement on this. He said, we don't break God's laws. We break ourselves against them. I mean, for a Christian, that's the choice. You either align with reality as it exists, which is centered around God, or you, or you break yourself. Um, God gives us the freedom to do that, to, to choose to break ourselves. But, um, you know, it's not what right he wants. <laughs> I have to write that one down. I, I know uh, when I was in England, um, I, had a, uh, I, was, I was having a, a taxi ride back from my mother's house to the airport. Which was about an hour's journey, and uh, it was the quickest way, cheapest way, actually, believe it or not. And so we were in the taxi and we're chatting away. And over time, you know, we started talking about faith and, and whatever. And you know, he said, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it's all just about decisions. You make your decisions, I make my decisions. There's no bad decisions. You know, it's all good. Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking, wow, you know. So I, I said, well, how about? You know, if, if my decision is not to pay you, you know, <laughs> with this yeah, taxi. It's great, Julian, yeah. And he said, well, my decision will be to hit you. And of course, he was mm -hmm. joking, you know, but I didn't feel threatened. Mm -hmm. But he said, well, my, you know, my, I think he said wallop. My, my choice would be to wallop you. And so it kind of like, just like <laughs> said to me, you know, when it's kind of like your truth is good as long as it works for you, you know. And if yeah. I, if I yeah. step over something that doesn't work for you, then it's, uh, my truth is bad, you know. So anyway, going off key there. Well, it's a really good. It's great that you did that. I think it's, you're right. We live in a postmodern age. It denies God. It denies any kind of objective notions of truth or of morality. You know, it's whatever I think is right or whatever I think is wrong. The problem is we actually, people don't live that way. You know, <laughs> they, 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 you know, if my employer says I'm going to withhold your paycheck because that's good for me, uh, you know, you know, people get upset, you know. So we, we live in a very practical way as if there is an objective morality, because we know it, actually. We're all made in God's image. We know deep down inside that there's uh, right and wrong. C.S. Lewis in, um, you know, his famous book, Mere Christianity, I, I'm sure you've read that, Julian. You know, he begins that book uh, with this uh, really provocative statement. He says, right and wrong are the clues to the meaning of the universe. And he, he goes on and says that all over the world, people have this curious idea that there's right ways to do things and wrong, and we can't seem to get rid of it. And uh, so we, it's, it's really good that you did that, that you point people back to that kind of innate sense that we all have of, 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 of objective morality, and we can't really get away from it. We're fooling ourselves when we, we say, hey, we can just kind of live with one another as if there is no such thing, um, doesn't work, society breaks down. Because as Lewis said as well, you know, uh, I'm paraphrasing him, you know, it's kind of, who is it that makes up what is right and what's wrong, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, and uh, so with the, with the biblical text, clearly that that's God. And um, so we have a choice 
either, as you say, to, to build ourselves up on his truth or to break ourselves against working against his truth. But what what does DNA do in order to share this truth? How, how do you uh, do that? Do you, do you do it via churches or individuals? How, how is this, this truth shared? Yeah, well, maybe I can talk a little bit more deeply about the mission of the DNA. So hmm. we... Um, when we talk about truth, um, I think for a lot of Christians, um, because of different things in recent church history, uh, we tend to think about truth spiritually. And so truth would be, well, God exists and he sent his son Jesus to be our savior and we need to share the gospel so that people can come to know Jesus and be saved. And of course, these are all profound and central truths to, to, um, to reality. And so it's important that Christians do that. But what gets neglected is uh, this larger sense of biblical truth that, um, you know, truth isn't just, uh, it's not just spiritual and it's not just something that relates to salvation. It's, uh, you know, if God exists and he created everything, then um, the Bible speaks to every area of life and it provides truth and princi principles from the scripture that apply to every area of society. Um, again, I think that this is something that the church, his, especially coming out of the Reformation, you know, that was such a pivotal time in the church history when Christians for the first time really opened up the Bible and they began to do their farming and their banking and their all these different things uh, on the basis of biblical truth. They put the Bible right at the center, not just of their personal salvation, but of every area of society. We've kind of drifted away from that. And so I, part of the way that we, had, our heart at the DNA, or I guess our mission is to try to remind or help people to recover this larger sense of what it means to be a Christian, to put the Bible central in every area of society. So we talk about that in terms of biblical worldview. Uh, the Bible isn't just a message of salvation, but it's a comprehensive worldview that makes sense of you know, every aspect of life. That I think is, um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the need in many ways, I think, especially in the global south, where, where we work primarily, churches in Africa, Asia, Latin America, are, they're fairly new uh, Christians there, um, a couple generations, and uh, they're still learning, and um, so just this exposure to biblical truth, and that's, that's uh, part of it, and then part of it is uh, how you live that out. This isn't a philosophy, or, you know, this isn't just heady stuff, this is actually very practical stuff that has to be lived out in very practical ways every day uh, in relationship to one another. And Bob, you know, is a great champion of that uh, piece of our ministry of just how do we live this out in very practical ways that, that, um, that, that, that impact people's lives, you know, kind of right down at the grassroots. So. Great. So, you know, it, it, it's all, it's essential to have the truth, but the truth propels, even demands, commands, something to come from it, something practical, so. Absolutely, right. Uh, would you say that knowing the truth is what enables people to love their neighbor, to even love their enemy, or part of the mix? Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, you know, let's just take the example of, right now we're kind of in almost a crisis, I think, in the church around this concept of love, because, because love has a meaning, it has a, a defined truth, if you will. There's a truthfulness about what love is. You know, in the Bible, truth and love are really the same. What you know, both I say they're two wings on a bird or the two sides of the same coin. I mean that they shouldn't be separated. So there's a truth about what love is, and that is, as I was sharing earlier, it's 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 this idea that um, I'm going to seek your good. Um, uh, even at great cost to myself, even, you know, even if it requires great sacrifice on my part. And of course you see this love uh, most prominently in the scriptures in the incarnation. I mean, God sends his own son, you know, at great cost to himself. And if Jesus gives his life at great cost to himself for our good, that's love. Now today, love is been kind of redefined in, especially the church in the West. And love means kind of in this postmodern cast, it means affirming uh, whatever you believe and trying to make you feel good about your particular beliefs and uh, not really questioning those things. Uh, so there's this idea of, you know, it's kind of associated with being nice, right? Being nice means, you know, affirming, you know, and uh, having empathy. 
you know, so uh, the problem with that is, of course, you can be affirming things that are destructive. Um, and, you know, to affirm something that's destructive, a destructive belief that somebody has, you know, biblically, we can't say that that's loving, actually. That's that's mm. not helping. That's that's harming them. So that's, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't want to get too heady about this. Oh, but it's good. You know, you have to, but, you know, you have to bring these two concepts together, truth and love. So, yes. Yes. No, I mean, I just know if if uh, if King Julian ruled the world, you know, with what he thought was <laughs> was right and wrong and what was love, you know, we'd we'd be uh, even in, in a bigger mess than what's now, you know. And sometimes uh, I don't like God's truth, but I, you know, because it, it doesn't work for me. Uh, but however, I know that um, when I go it alone on my own wisdom and what's right for me, it always ends in someone getting hurt. So, um, so, so tell me. Uh, with either with yourself or with your uh, colleagues at DNA, can you give us some examples of of how uh, you know you, you've taught this to people and and the effects that have come from it? What, what what transformations have you seen? What what effects have taken place? Well, it's been you know in many respects it, it's been very powerful. Uh, I like to tell one particular story because it gives an illustration I think pretty well of what what kind of impact truth can have. And uh, this is a story that comes from our close friend, Arturo Cuba, who's uh, he's a Peruvian uh, missionary and pastor. And for many years, he was serving in Guatemala. And he was working there amongst a indigenous group called the Pocomchi. Um, and uh, this particular indigenous group had been evangelized. So 100, 100 years prior to him coming, you know, missionaries had come. And many of these in, indigenous people had accepted Christ and they had churches now, small churches. Um, they are subsistence farmers. Um, their main crop was corn. Uh, the, yet they, even though they had churches, they continued to live in really abject poverty. The you know, infant mortality rate was extremely high. Uh, it was one of the poorest groups in a very poor country. So Right now, you should be going, now something's wrong, right? These people have become Christians, and yet they're still really struggling with abject poverty. And what's the problem? What's wrong with that? And Arturo basically diagnosed it in that the gospel had come as a message of salvation, and they had received that, but it hadn't come as a worldview. And, of course, they had their own worldview. They've had it for centuries. In this case, it was a very animistic worldview, uh, a very fatalistic worldview. And that really hadn't been touched. And so there wasn't really a discipleship um, at the level of worldview, if you, if you would. So there was, they, they were saved, you know, I have no doubt, you know, but, and they loved the Lord, but that they still had an animistic mind. And that's just a quick point on that. I think sometimes we have this conception as Christians that once we're saved, then all of a sudden, all these false ideas that we've built up from our, you know, family and our culture just go away. And all this biblical truth just kind of replaces, you know, and it's not that way, you know, uh, that certainly begins to happen, you know, for sure. But uh, it's a lifelong process of just kind of replacing false presuppositions we've learned from our culture and replacing them with biblical truth. And it requires a bit of discipline. It requires some intentionality. It doesn't just happen by osmosis. So in this case, it hadn't happened. And what Arturo did is he said, well, we need some biblical truth. What's the truth? Um, and he began to look around and he saw that every year, for example, rats would come into their corn fields and eat half the corn before it was adequately stored. And, um, and so we began to question them about this, you know, and, and as a result, you know, their kids were, were hungry, uh, malnourished and dying early. And so he began to question them about this and he's, you know, what? What's going on here? Why are you why are you losing half your crop to these rats? And their answer was something that you know I think for Western people you know it puzzles us because we were so shaped by biblical ideas because of our heritage, but they weren't. So they said, "Well, rats always eat half the corn. That's what that you know they've always done that. They did that with my parents, my grandparents, my great grand. I mean, that's you know it's just the way it is, and they're going to do it to me and my kids. You know, and there's essentially is nothing I can do about it. That." That's the, that's just kind of, that's the way it is. That's, this is fatalistic mindset. So he uh, 
you know, they were um, not a literate group. And so he had to be very creative with his biblical discipleship. So he thought, well, we need to teach dominion. So we did it with, in terms of skits, he was very creative. And so he said, uh, <clears throat> okay, I want you to pretend you're rats and you, you are gonna be the farmers. And so he kind of divided them up and he said to the rats, you know, you go out there and you just, uh, or you know, he said to the farmers, you go, you go out into the field, pick the corn, put it on a plate and serve it to the rats. The rats can just sit back, life is good. You know, the farmer does all the work, does all the weeding, all the watering, and then he just serves the food to the rats, right? And so it was kind of funny, right? And then uh, he then he read Genesis, you know, 1, 20, 27, 28, you know, about uh, God putting man in the garden and giving them giving him dominion over uh, the animals. And, uh, you know, and he, he basically ended that by saying, now, who has dominion here? Do you or the rats? You know, it's a very basic question, very basic biblical truth. And they all kind of were like quiet and they kind of felt embarrassed. And they go, well, actually, the rats. So he said, okay, should it be that way? And they said, no, okay, then, well, what are you going to do about it? So it was that simple of a biblical truth, but that profound of one that we're, we, God made us in his image to take dominion over creation, not vice versa. We take that for granted. We just totally take that idea for granted, but there's many places around the world that that's a, that's a, that's a powerful new idea, a biblical idea, a truthful idea. Hmm. And when they were introduced to that and saw that, they didn't need western people to come down and do community development projects with money and i mean they came up with their own ideas too they were very smart people and so they created their own corn cribs and uh, within a year um almost all of their crop was uh was was stored and they began the children began to come out of poverty oh, so what was the difference it was just bi just a basic biblical truth that we all take for granted it just hadn't been taught it hadn't been discipled in a practical way that made an impact. That's a good, I just think, I love that example. Yeah. Because, yeah, it just, you know, it just shows us the power of biblical truth to bring about transformation in impoverished communities. And we've seen that over and over again. Um, so that's the kind of thing we're looking for is, is, is that kind of discipleship that opens up the scripture, kind of counters it with the, these false beliefs that people have and, um, you know, lets them make a choice to follow the truth. And, uh, and, wow, so and, and, it, yeah. So you know, it's a biblical truth jumping from the page, uh, in practical ways to literally help people uh, with their physical needs. And uh, so it's it's um, we're going to have to come and bring you back some other time because uh, um, we have uh, about two minutes, and I don't want to do a disservice to uh, another topic. Um, but very uh, briefly, uh, you've, uh, the word on the street is that you've written a new book. Uh, and so uh, just tell, tell us the title and give us the, uh, the elevator version of your, of your new book. And we can talk about it in depth at another time. Sure. Thanks, Julian. Yeah, the, the book is titled Why Social Justice is Not Biblical Justice, An Urgent Appeal to Fellow Christians in a Time of Social Crisis. And um, it's uh, basically it's 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 a way that I you know I felt kind of led to address this whole movement of uh, social justice in the West. Uh, academically, it goes by the name critical theory. It's become pervasive. It's behind movements like Black Lives Matter. It's in our universities. Um, if you're my age, you're for sure your kids are exposed to it in social media. <laughs> it's everywhere. And I, I wanted to really look at this and say, well, what is going on? And you know, that uses this word justice and social justice. And a lot of Christians, I think, are going, well, if, then it's good, right? Because it's just. It's talking about justice. But I wanted to expose it for what I really see it as, which is a, a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit of biblical justice. And um, it has all sorts of very harmful and destructive um, consequences. Um, so it's the call to kind of see through that and to say, this is not biblical, this is not true. And therefore it's, it's destructive to relationships and to society and call Christians back to a biblical justice and just kind of recover that understanding from the scriptures of what justice really is. Wow. Okay, well, so uh, 
a heady and uh, difficult topic, yet one that's very relevant for our time. How do we truly love our neighbor, regardless of what color their skin is or what background they're from? You've been listening to The Kingdom and Its Stories. My name is Julian Gibb, and today, as I say, we're blessed to have Scott Allen. But do tune in again next week to learn more. Thank you.